Hey everybody, Dr. Mack here, uh, not in my usual lecture hall, but actually down here in my basement in St. Paul. Reason we're meeting in this format, I conveyed to you, I think, uh, via our class announcement, we've had so many students who've had issues with COVID testing or possible exposure and have needed to miss class that I thought uh, doing at least one lecture in this format while not my preferred way of doing it, might be helpful to y'all students. So here's what we're up to today. Today, we're gonna look at different kinds of art media that we didn't talk about the other day. Some of our content will be done in short presentational bursts, like the one you're listening to right now, and the rest will be done via the PowerPoint slides that will contain the whole shout of lecture two on media. So. Let me start right now the same way I love to when we all are together in our lecture hall and ask a question. Is there any way that you can think of to help make sense of the fact that in the same moments historically, different kind of art media will be competing against each other and some moments of media success will look fantastic for one form of art and look terrible for another? Who wins, who loses, and why, as we look at different historic moments and media? Well, one of the challenges we face as critics at any level is to look at art and come to terms with what causes art to change. We tried to get at some of the potential backbone issues of change the other day in our Tuesday class when we talked about certain issues related to technology, in particular, we look clear back to that transition moment from the Renaissance to the Reformation when we talked about Gutenberg, the Bible being published for the first time in a printing press, and other kinds of media that were then printed in the same format. Then we went on to talk about different kinds of two-dimensional media that have gotten the word out about brand building. Remember, we showed Isaac Newton uh, and the image of him that appeared all over the learned world as Newton's own star rose during the so-called scientific revolution. And remember also, we looked at different iconographic kinds of images of political power, particularly in the 18th century around the French Revolution. So that sort of printing press or printing model came to be super important, as we said, Art went through a kind of moment of democratization where images could be printed up and produced in chapbooks and all kinds of other outlets that we discussed in our class. Still, the larger question, which media wins, which media loses, and is there any kind of big picture or meta way of making sense about how come art media changes over time? This is an issue that historians and critics have torn apart in multiple ways for decades and even centuries. I want to invoke the name of a theorist whose adherents still hold tremendous sway in the world of art criticism, but whose name makes us think instead of art uh, about politics, and in particular, even about our own moment of politics today. The name of the person is Karl Marx. So you may be recoiling already and thinking, oh my goodness, Dr. Mack is about to go full on red at us. After all, he's got his Liverpool supporter cap on. Settle down. Here's how we want to look, about, look at Karl Marx and think about Marx. Let me give some background first. Who was he and why do we care in Art 100? Karl Marx was, in effect, a political and philosophical genius as a young man, and he finished college super quickly and was already involved in a graduate program by the 1820s. So about a quarter century or thereabouts after the French Revolution. And when Marx went to graduate school, the dominant name and the person he studied with or under oh, talked about all over Europe, but particularly in German circles where Marx was learning, was Georg Hegel. And Hegel was this amazing and gifted intellect who could pontificate and think and lecture on almost anything under the sun related to philosophy and identity. But in most of his works, and in particular the work that moved Marx so much, the phenomenology of spirit, 
What Hegel talked about were the incredibly complex processes related to identity formation. First of all, personal identity, like what makes us us? And then on a more collective or communal level, a, a bigger question about collective spirit or the phenomenology of our age. Who are we communally? So Hegel pondered and worked on and researched every element of identity formation that one could imagine back in the 1820s and before. And in his work, he identified three amazingly important, in his estimation, moments of identity formation. The driver of everything, moment number one, Hegel called the thesis. And the thesis is that push toward like actualization or identity formation that's about discovering or acknowledging who elementally one is. This is myself. Then Hegel posited a moment that was in contrast, almost battle with identity moment one, and he named that the antithesis. So the thesis is who I am, the antithesis is who I am not. And Hegel finally went on to explain a third moment of kind of coming together or coalescing uh, that he called synthesis. Now, Karl Marx, as a young student, was part of a huge group of the so-called young Hegelians, followers of Georg Hegel. But for Marx, it felt like too much ivory tower talk. And I think everybody who's attached to a university campus has some sense of ivory tower talk because professors, uh, you know, self-proclaimed here, were full of it, or at least full of ivory tower talk. So for Marx, who in his own lifetime had heard and felt the echoes and reverberation of two huge things. One, the French Revolution and Napoleon's consolidation of revolutionary ideals. And two, the fledgling emerging industrial revolution, especially in England. For Marx, it felt like too much pie in the sky theorizing and talking to follow so fully the ideas of Hegel. What Karl Marx did instead was take the abstractions of identity formation Hegel talked about, thesis, antithesis, and, th and synthesis, and instead look exactly at historic circumstances. And Marx called his idea historical materialism. And for historical materialists like Marx, one still looked at three moments, thesis, antithesis, and thesis and synthesis rather, but instead of talking about huge amorphous things like self-conception or communal identity, what Marx looked at were pressingly real and galv galvanizingly energetic historic truths, things that could be measured, looked at, quantified, and how those truths conflicted with each other, a thesis and antithesis and a new thing, a synthesis. Marx looked at history. And so he looked at the ideas, for example, that we've talked about in our class about aesthetic theory. He looked at the 18th century enlightenment and he saw all of these abstractions about secularism and rational thought and science and the privileging of kind of reason. And he looked at that as like this purity, this expression of an abstraction that was true and pure and wonderful and that came under the kind of pummeling force of economic necessity, of poverty, of the need for bread and food that the French revolutionaries made manifest from 1789 on in the French Revolution. And he saw the thesis of ideas and then the antithesis of the French revolutionaries' fists and their violence and their guillotines. And that brought about what he saw as the synthesis of Napoleon Bonaparte and the after effects of the French Revolution. Now that's Marx. And Marx would look at thesis, antithesis, and synthesis in all aspects of historical experience and come up with huge galvanizing arguments about the fact that, in his mind, revolution was inevitable. Why? Because all the means of production were controlled, Marx argued, by the rich, whereas all the actual producing, he said, was done by the poor. 
And if you kept that system going for too long, as he knew history would see to it that that happened, there'd eventually be, he said, an inevitable revolution. Well, that may have happened. That may not have happened. That's up as a jump ball for history to look at. The critical thing is Marx also leveled arguments about the relationship between technology and culture. And that is interesting to us in our class. Why? Because we've seen with Gutenberg, we've seen with all the different printing techniques that arise in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, new ways of getting media, new ways of getting books, new ways of getting argumentation out into the, the public sphere. And at that point, following Marx, media is either about maintaining the system so there isn't change, so art is used to make power more powerful and more stable, or media is about revolution. It's about disruption. It's about argumentation against the status quo. Which way would it go? Well, the 19th century is littered, as is the 20th, with moments of massive thesis antithesis collision. And people who followed Marx, Marx was himself fundamentally an economist and a, theory, a theorist of philosophy. His followers, however, have gone into every range of criticism, particularly art and gender theory and post-colonial work and, and, as well, have taken basic Marxian principles and applied them to help make sense of things like how art changes and what the relationship is between art and technology. So it's no surprise, these theorists say, that the French Revolution pops up in the 1780s at, a, at exactly the moment when radical ideas about the Enlightenment have become the stuff of art. So one can see in these chapbooks we talked about on Tuesday, complex notions of general will and equality and rational thought hammered out in simple to follow images that tell a story even the illiterate can read. It's also no surprise, Marxian theory and Marxist theorists tell us that as the 19th century kicks on into the 20th century, we reach an age of what Marxian theorists like Theodore Adorno would call the age of mechanical reproduction, where it's possible using media that Marx could never have imagined to produce in innumerable quantities vast and compelling works of art that link up with other kinds of textual discourse and didactic stuff so that it's possible to do what Marx wasn't sure anyone would soon figure out how to do, which was to educate people about politics or about new ways of thinking as regards the social formation. This becomes super important, this notion of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Because those posters we finished with the other day that show the great sea liners, that show ads for spas, that were all about transportation and the railroad, those are after all, in Marxian theory, those are ways of trying to make the capitalistic system more bearable, more attractive, more compelling. One can, after all, have a vacation. It can be at one of these gorgeous places, locations. And the Marxian theory that Theodore Adorno and others who followed Karl Marx in the 20th century in the so-called Frankfurt School would articulate with tremendous force is all about the role that art has played in either offering people a kind of way of opposing the system, of smashing the state through outsider art and through antagonistic literatures that are illustrated and that come to life, painted on walls and broadcast over media that we now see every day in television and in every other form, you know, up to and including Instagram and TikTok. Things that are about change that are about disruption, that are about welcoming us to the new world that needs us, or those parts of art that can be reproduced mechanistically, that instead of prompting change, instead create a harder and heavier yoke 
for us to wear around our necks. And that yoke is about maintaining a power and money relationship, Marxian theorists tell us. It's not about us as farmers and professors and common people who do the best we can do with our lives and with our chances. It's not about promoting us to become stronger, smarter, and more invested in the world. Instead, it's about how we can participate in holding our own selves down while a system that doesn't always benefit us continues to do tremendous profitable work for the people who are on top of us. That's the Marxian theory. You can take that or you can leave that, but I put it out there. And I put it out there because there aren't a lot of theorists who have done on the huge scale Marx has done and his followers have, have, have added tremendous insights to as well. There isn't a lot out there that offers us this meta picture about how art changes and why it changes and how it is that opposing forces, the thesis and the antithesis, as Marx defined them following Hegel, produce a synthesis that's only going to work and last for a certain period of time. Why? Because in the Marxian scheme that I think he is actually quite right about, there's always a new thesis embedded in whatever the last synthesis has been. Why? Because we can't keep art static. We can't hold it down. It's meant to change. It's meant to grow. It's dynamic and it's about taking control back, taking control back from any forces forever that have tried to hold us down as creators. So we're gonna move on now and run through a couple of slides that offer some images about the things I've just discussed. And we'll return shortly to talk a bit more about the ideas.